For most of us, it's difficult to comprehend a life behind bars. But inside America's female prisons, 55 violent offenders have only the passing of time to contemplate their fate. If I could turn back time and do things over, none of this would have ever happened. I would have never hurt anybody. He said that I would have the X amount of voltage going through my body because I was sentenced to die by the electric chair. I knew from the beginning that I would be found guilty. And I knew from the beginning that I would get the death penalty. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty of murder. But how did they end up here? What is their side of the story? And what will be their fate? Find out next. These are the women on death row. I've never wanted to die. I lost everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me, because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. I think I'm going to wake up from this nightmare. <laughs> It is a virtual paradise, the sandy beaches of Daytona Beach, Florida. But in November of 1989, the big news was an unfolding saga of crime, violent schemes and murders that read better than a Hollywood movie script. There have been some other bizarre murders in the Daytona area, but, but nothing is as complex and bizarre as this one. It's one of the most incredible stories that I've ever, ever read about or heard about. The web of murder stretched from the homeless to the high-profile rich. At the center was a 20-year-old party girl from New England, Deirdre Hunt. If I could turn back time and do things over, I would have never came to Florida. None of this would have ever happened. Deirdre Michelle Hunt will soon celebrate her 37th birthday, confined to a maximum security cell block. When I first arrived on death row, I was 21 years old. I was the second youngest in the country to be sentenced to death row. Death row was extremely frightening in a bunch of terms, and the isolation helped me actually come back to reality a little bit. Her death sentence might be called just the final blow. Abused and neglected as a child, Deirdre was seeking escape in drugs by the second grade. By the fourth grade, she was having sex. She, very early on in life, I think 11 years old, she was raped by a 31-year-old man. Lee Butcher explores Deirdre's story in his book, Sex, Money, and Murder in Daytona Beach. She had a quality about her that drew people to her, a way about her that some people described as haunting. She had a lot going for her. She just chose to go a different path. Deirdre dropped out of school after the ninth grade. She made money as a streetwalker, but worse was to come. I believe that she wants to explore the dark side, and I think it gives her a sense of power. Guns also gave Deirdre a sense of power. At 18, she and a lesbian lover made a random attack on a woman in a parked car in Manchester, New Hampshire. Deirdre shot the woman six times, wounding but not killing her. Deirdre and her girlfriend were soon arrested. She had been investigated uh, and actually charged with uh, attempted murder. To avoid a lengthy prison term, Deirdre turned on her accomplice. Deirdre made a deal with the uh, state attorney to testify against this girl that had claimed that she did the shooting in turn for getting a lighter sentence. But the woman who had been shot recovered and she was in the courtroom and she said, I don't see the woman here that shot me. And the charges against Deirdre were dropped. Deirdre got lucky, but Manchester was getting too hot for her. And in September of 1989, she headed south with a boyfriend to the sun-drenched party town of Daytona Beach, Florida. Daytona Beach was always the melting pot. If anybody was wanted, for some reason they came to Daytona Beach. You know, the beach was a great hangout for all the transients to sleep down there at night. Soon after they arrived, Deirdre's boyfriend beat her up and left town. The 20-year-old was alone in a strange place. It was like being in a different country. It's still very foreign to me. The mindset 
in the culture down here. But Deirdre was a survivor. By the end of the month, she had a new group of friends and a part-time job at Top Shots. She also started having an affair with the pool hall's owner, a Greek immigrant named Costa Fotopoulos. Costa was a legendary figure to the kids on the boardwalk. He eventually became legendary to the lead prosecutor, David Damore. You have to understand the, the, the mentality of, 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 of Deidre and many of her associates. These were kids that literally were living on the street. They were living from day to day. And Costa Fotopoulos lived in a big mansion on the river. He drove a BMW, so they looked up to him. I ended up drinking and I slept with him and I was gonna leave. And that was the time that he had tortured and raped me and told me that my life was over. He burned her with cigarettes and said, I can do anything to you I want, and you can't do anything about it, you're a nobody. He had told me that he had somebody before me and that he killed her because she tried to get away from him. Investigators say Costa Fotopoulos was a sociopath and that his violent past existed mostly in his imagination. In fact, he was only an ex-waiter who married money. Costa's wife, Lisa Paspalakis, was part of Daytona Beach's Greek elite. To Costa, she was a meal ticket. Costa didn't have any money. All the money was on Lisa's side of the family. The Paspalakis family had a very uh, lucrative business on the boardwalk that was worth millions of dollars. Lisa Paspalakis gave Costa everything he needed, actually bought this business for him. As Costa's mistress, Deirdre got a taste of life she'd never known. And understand, she was coming from literally being a street person to getting to go to parties where she was mixing with the mayor of Daytona Beach, as if that was some big deal. But to her, it was a big deal. And that's what she was looking for. She believed that Costa Fotopoulos was really big, powerful, and important and as big as John Gotti in Daytona Beach. And she decided to go along with him because uh, she would go places. Costa soon realized Deirdre could be more than just a mistress. With her intelligence and her contacts on the boardwalk, she could be his partner in crime. Costa made me go give orders to other people, pass on messages, or that he would tell me what he wanted done. She was above the the street urchins. You know, she wasn't having to be out there peddling the, the drugs and, and ripping people off and doing burglaries. But Costa dreamed of crimes beyond counterfeiting and burglary. He had a fantastic scheme to turn the boardwalk kids into the hunter killer club. These were to be assassins for hire. People that would kill anybody for $10,000 to $100,000. And his idea was to use these young transients as his uh, modern day version of the Murder, Inc. Everyone would be videotaped while killing somebody. And so that if anybody decided to turn somebody else in, then their tape would be released to the police as well. In October 1989, Costa told Deirdre she was ready to be initiated into the Hunter Killer Club. Her first victim would be 21-year-old Kevin Ramsey. Kevin was just an, a, a street kid that was trying to survive. Kevin was a bartender at Top Shots, where he skimmed money and planned to blackmail Costa over his counterfeiting activities. Costa fired him and then told Deirdre to contact Kevin with an offer of friendship and a test of courage. So they told him that they wanted him to go out in the woods with him to initiate him into the Hunter Killer Club. And they said what they would do they would tie him to a tree, and then they would shoot at his feet. They said, we're not going to shoot you, we're just going to shoot at your feet. And he agreed to this. On the night of October 3rd, 1989, Costa drove Deirdre and Kevin to a lonely spot in the woods. It wasn't until he had turned off and we were there that he had told me his plan to kill Kevin. I think he terrorized her, but I do not believe that she was so scared of him that she could not say no. I think Deirdre was very much the mistress of her own fate. Kevin let himself be tied to a tree. Deirdre had a 22 semi-automatic with a silencer. 
Ironically, Costa held a video camera and a light, capturing the entire gruesome murder on tape. She voluntarily took the weapon out. Uh, she walked up. Costa said, uh, you know, come closer, I can't see you. And then Deidre says, uh, don't shine that in my eyes, shine it down lower. Don't shine that in my eyes. Don't shine that in my eyes, shine it down. and does something with the weapon, like wipes the barrel of the weapon. He swipes it on the side of her, of her pant legs, puts it up immediately without hesitation, and sh shoots three times directly into his chest. And then without any hesitation, she walks directly up to him, pulls his head by its hair, and puts a gun up to his temple and blows his brains out. But Kevin's body was still twitching. Costa put down the video camera and shot Kevin in the head with an AK-47. They left Kevin's body to rot and drove back to town. In reality, this videotape of Deidre Hunt killing Mark Ramsey was Costa's insurance policy. He could blackmail her for the rest of her life. The next day, Costa gave Deirdre a black beret, the uniform of the Hunter Killer Club. But Costa now wanted Deirdre to kill his wife, Lisa. People don't understand that when you come here, they just break you down. You're just an inmate. You're just a number. You're lucky if they call you by your name. People can be brutal in here, and you have people that will do whatever they have to do to survive. It's like almost a survival of the fittest. But Deirdre Michelle Hunt sits in a Florida cell block for an obvious reason. October 4th, 1989, less than 24 hours after killing Kevin Ramsey in the woods outside Daytona Beach, Costa Fotopoulos and Deirdre make plans to kill Costa's wife, Lisa. Costa thought that with Lisa dead, he would inherit her business holdings, plus an insurance policy worth $700,000 and he brought Deidre Hunt into that plan with the idea that they would live happily ever after and split all that money together and, and go on from there. But Deirdre flatly refused to commit a second murder for Costa. You can't make me do that. Unless you're standing there with a gun on me, you can't make me do something like that. Costa agreed. Someone else could kill Lisa, but Deirdre would help find the assassin. The overall plan was they were gonna hire someone then that someone would kill Lisa Fotopoulos and Costa Fotopoulos would be around to then in turn kill them. No loose ends. First, Deirdre persuaded an ex-boyfriend, J.R. Taylor, to shoot Lisa as part of a fake robbery. They called him J.R. and offered him $10,000 to kill Lisa Fotopoulos, but J.R. never showed up. Costa and Deirdre made at least six more attempts using three other boardwalk transients. Finally, Deirdre persuaded another of her ex-lovers, 18-year-old Brian Chase, to break into Costa and Lisa's home. He went to the house, uh, cut a window open, um, went into the house. And then he walks up a, a staircase to the third floor and goes directly into Costa and uh, Lisa's room. And then as he opens the door of that room, Costa is immediately in front, lying on the bed. And underneath the bed, there's a, a array of uh, automatic weapons. He walks around the bed and walks on the other side where Lisa was sleeping and shoots Lisa one time in the head. The gun jams. And at that point, Costa fires and shoots Brian Chase. Brian was dead. Ironically, Lisa Fotopoulos was wounded, but still alive. The murder had been botched. It sounded to me like a grade B movie. It appeared to just be a residential burglary where the homeowner had shot and killed the perpetrator and Costa would have been the hero. Some of the seasoned officers on the scene said, you know, this just doesn't look right. It looked like it had almost been staged the cop's instincts were about to be confirmed. The dispatcher got a 911 call from a telephone booth, and it turned out to be JR. He indicated that he had been approached by a female, Deidre Hunt, 
to commit this crime and to, and to shoot Lisa Vitopoulos. Police brought Deidre in for questioning. It seems to me that she told us she didn't know anything about any shooting until she saw it on the news, and we knew that wasn't true. I said, what is it you want? She says, I want a deal. I said, well, there are no deals. She says, well, I don't know what to do. If I talk to you, Costa will kill me. She had a bag of potato chips on her, on her lap, and I looked down at the potato chips, and I said, well, what do you got there? She says, potato chips. I said, no, you got a bag. You're holding a bag right now for Costa Fotopoulos. You need to decide who you're going to talk to. Deirdre realized she had to give the police detailed information and on videotape. She was happy to do it. This was like literally she was the star of a show. So she's talking about the homicide involved in the incident at the Paspalakis residence where Lisa was shot. And then she comes up, oh, oh, by the way, you know, we killed this kid out in the woods and we video recorded it. And there was just silence because we were all looking at each other and saying, you know, are we insane? Or is this girl insane? Because, you know, what is she talking about? I ended up having to take them to um, Kevin. And then they leaped that. And we found the body of Kevin Ramsey at the uh, crime scene. But he was pretty much decomposed at that point. Deirdre and Costa were each taken into custody. In a search of Costa's home, police discovered the videotape of the murder of Kevin Ramsey. For Deirdre Hunt, there could be no more damning piece of evidence. Deirdre Hunt was charged with the murder of Kevin Ramsey. Um, Deirdre Hunt was charged as a principal to the murder of Brian Chase. She was charged with the attempted murder of Lisa Fotopoulos. I knew that I didn't do, I didn't mastermind anything, that I wasn't really part of that and that I wouldn't do that to human beings or other people. So I just had to focus on that, that I wasn't that person. There was no jury trial. At the last minute, Deirdre pleaded guilty, hoping that the judge would give her life without parole rather than sentence her to death in the electric chair. At her sentencing hearing, Deirdre and her attorney portrayed her as a victim who had been dominated by Costa. He had forced me to shoot Kevin that um, he had an AK-47 on me, and that if I hadn't have done what he had told me to, I wouldn't have lived. The prosecution was able to prove that even though Costa had an AK-47, he couldn't have held it while handling the video camera and the light, and so couldn't have directly threatened Deirdre. To Deirdre, that didn't seem to matter. If I have to say that way back, it, the way my mind was at at that time, I believed he was invincible. The prosecution countered Deirdre's claims of being an unwilling victim by playing Costa's videotape. Don't sign it on my eyes, sign it down. Give me that. That it. Come close, I can see you. Don't shine that in my eyes. Doesn't sound like somebody that's very intimidated of the person he's, he or she is dealing with. Deirdre Hunt was sentenced to death. She was transferred to the Lowell Correctional Annex where she spent 23 hours of every day locked in a six by nine foot cell. When I was on death row, it was different. Whenever I came out of my room, I had to be restrained. There was moments that I was afraid I was gonna die in the electric chair to actually be convicted and sentenced to death row and isolated from human beings when you're only 20 years old was, was very, very terrifying. Costa Fotopoulos was also sentenced to death. His wife, Lisa, who survived with a bullet in her brain, testified against him and divorced him as well. Costa remains on death row to this day. He sits in a room and nobody hurts him. Nobody rapes him, nobody intimidates him, nobody scares him. And so Florida, in one sense, is just protecting him from what would have happened if he had been in prison for the rest of his life. As for Deirdre, in 1998, the Florida Supreme Court, concerned about the way her case was originally handled, granted Deirdre a new trial. 
She was allowed to withdraw her guilty plea, and so we started basically from square one. This time, she would face a jury and a different judge, but would the outcome be the same? I feel responsible for every person that got hurt in this crime. She raised the defense of battered woman syndrome and, and claimed that it was Costa Vitopoulos basically that made her do it. Um, there was also evidence presented um, in the testimony of Deirdre Hunt's mother um, about Deirdre's background, which was not a um, you know, storybook background at all. Deirdre Hunt was found guilty by the jury um, in the second trial. She uh, waived having the jury decide the sentence, and the judge actually decided the sentence. When I came back to prison and I was sentenced to life with 25 mandatory, um, instead of the death penalty, it was like having freedom. It was like being free again. Even though I couldn't go home to my mom and it wasn't the complete freedom you want, it was almost like being free because you have been locked up and isolated for so long that it was, it was a gift. But after almost eight years on death row, the transition to general population wasn't easy. You know, you have human contact, but there are very few friends that I have. There's only one group here that really has helped me throughout the years, and that was Art Spring with Leslie Neal. We use the arts as a form of communication and discipline and commitment, and they, they learn to get in touch with their emotions, to be given the chance to recreate who they could become. Deirdre has now learned to express herself in art, writing, and dance. She shared some of her paintings and the poems she has written. Some of the pictures that I brought were when I was on death row and I did some, some therapy and got some artwork out. There's some poetry out there, there's some journaling that I did. And without that and without facing those types of things, you're always going to be a, a constant victim. It is a consolation for a woman who became more notorious for once performing murder. I would want people to know that even though I was 20 and even though I was broken, that I was a victim and that I could be manipulated like that and I could be used like that because of who I was at that time, that people don't stay that way. I didn't stay that way. I was 21 years old. I was the second youngest in the country to be sentenced to death row. Death row was extremely frightening in a bunch of terms, and the isolation helped me actually come back to reality a little bit. Her death sentence might be called just the final blow. Abused and neglected as a child, Deirdre was seeking escape in drugs by the second grade. By the fourth grade, she was having sex. She, very early on in life, I think 11 years old, she was raped by a 31-year-old man. Lee Butcher explores Deirdre's story in his book, Sex, Money, and Murder in Daytona Beach. She had a quality about her that drew people to her, a way about her that some people described as haunting. She had a lot going for her. She just chose to go a different path. Deirdre dropped out of school after the ninth grade. She made money as a street walker, but worse was to come. I believe that she wants to explore the dark side, and I think it gives her a sense of power. Guns also gave Deirdre a sense of power. At 18, she and a lesbian lover made a random attack on a woman in a parked car in Manchester, New Hampshire. Deirdre shot the woman six times, wounding but not killing her. Deirdre and her girl, their fate, find out next. These are the women on death row. I've never wanted to die. I lost everything I ever cared about, everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me, because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. I think I'm going to wake up from this nightmare. 
It is a virtual paradise, the sandy beaches of Daytona Beach, Florida. But in November of 1989, the big news was an unfolding saga of crime, violence. For most of us, it's difficult to comprehend a life behind bars. But inside America's female prisons, 55 violent offenders have only the passing of time to contemplate their fate. If I could turn back time and do things over, none of this would have ever happened. I would have never hurt anybody. He said that I would have the X amount of voltage going through my body because I was sentenced to die by the electric chair. I knew from the beginning that I would be found guilty, and I knew from the beginning that I would get the death penalty. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty of murder. But how did they end up here? What is their side of the story? And what will be the schemes and murders that read better than a Hollywood movie script? There have been some other bizarre murders in the Daytona area, but but nothing is as complex and bizarre as this one. It's one of the most incredible stories that I've ever, ever read about or heard about. The web of murder stretched from the homeless to the high profile rich. At the center was a 20 year old party girl from New England, Deirdre Hunt. If I could turn back time and do things over, I would have never came to Florida. None of this would have ever happened. Deirdre Michelle Hunt will soon celebrate her 37th birthday confined to a maximum security cell block. When I first arrived on death